Well, this morning we're at the end of Acts chapter 12, and so if you've got a phone or a Bible, you can pull it out and you can turn there and uh, we'll be there in just a few moments. But we continue our journey through the book of Acts and our series called The Movement. And Acts is all about a movement, a movement that Jesus began and then handed over to some pretty common, ordinary individuals, kind of like you and me. And yet what we've been seeing is that this movement, this movement that we're talking about is really God's movement. God's movement which he carries out through us. That's what the theme of the series has been about. It's God's movement, all his. He's orchestrating it, but he's using you and me. And so this morning, uh, we're going we're gonna to step back just a bit and we're going to see the book of Acts in this process that we see the movement happens and how it moves, and, and we're going to sort of map out the book of Acts a bit so we can kind of see how it works. And, and what we see is that Acts is all about how, well, what Jesus asked the early Christian church and us to do way in the beginning of the book of Acts. We see it actually happen, where he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so you could, in a way, kind of divide the book of Acts into two. In fact, I've got this graphic up here. I think we've got it. Wow, that's not very clear. Sorry about that. That didn't translate. But it gives you a bit of an idea that there are really two different sections of the book of Acts. And so we're right here at the end of chapter 12. We're on the precipice of jumping into the second section. So you got the first part, and that's chapters 1 through 12. And and one of the main people that's a part of it is Peter. We see him as being the leader. And it's really about reaching Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. It's about reaching the Jews. But then when we get into chapter 13, we go into the second part. And instead of it being Peter, we're starting now to follow Paul. And Paul is all about the, well, not just Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, but to the ends of the earth. Not just to Jews, but to all people. And so we see that it reaches, even by the end of Acts, to the known world of that day, which was Rome. First to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. And so even the last couple of weeks, we, if you've been with us, we've, we've heard a bit of this, this shift from part one to part two. In fact, Peter himself, he says in chapter 10, he says, I realize now how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know, the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. And, and so the movement's growing. The scope, the mission is expanding. This is now for everyone. To give you a bit of a picture uh, of how this all uh, goes, we, we found some maps. Hopefully they're clearer than the first graphic that we got. Um, and, and here's the very first one. And this kind of gives you an idea uh, of the reach of the gospel during the ministry of Jesus. With Jesus and the disciples, here's where the good news went. All right? It, it reached Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And that's where the good news went. But then we get to this next image here. And by the, well, by five, seven years after Jesus rose again and ascended into heaven, we, we see that the first part of Acts, it, it reaches all the way up to Antioch, all the way up to Antioch the, up there, it, where it, it continues to spread further and further. In, in fact, in chapter 10, we caught up with Peter as he made it to Antioch. In chapter uh, 11, we see Paul and Barnabas there in Tarsus in Antioch. In fact, in verse 26 of chapter 11, we see that the disciples were, were first called Christians in Antioch. But then we get to chapter 12. At the end of that chapter, we, start, we pick it up at verse 25. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, and taking with them John, also called Mark. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, uh, called, or Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manon, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, 
Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. There's actually two cities that we come across in the book of Acts that are named Antioch. And um, this one here, though, is in Syria. You just saw it in the map not, not long ago, just straight north of Jerusalem. It's right on the border of Turkey and Syria. And early on, this becomes a significant outpost for the movement. And all these religious leaders, all these leaders of the movement were gathered there. And in the midst of all that, God makes it clear to send out Barnabas and Saul, or we might call him Paul. In verse 3, so after they had fasted and they prayed and they placed their hands on them, they sent them off. And the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed to, from there to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. And they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. And so Saul, who later in chapter 13, we no longer call him Saul at all, we, we use the Latin name of him, which is Paul, he starts his first missionary journey, which takes him significantly further west than, than even the, Latin, the next Antio uh, Antioch that we see. Um, and, and in the midst of that journey, he goes in a significant area as we see the gospel continue to grow further and further. And Paul then takes even more journeys, missionary journeys, reaching more and more people. And, and as we go through Acts, we can see, um, well, a second, a third, maybe even a fourth journey. It depends how you interpret all of it. Um, in the book, chapters of 15 through 21, and on those journeys, the movement starts to reach towns like, can we go to the next slide? Like, well, Philippi, which maybe you recall is, is the letter of Philippians. It's a letter to the people in Philippi. And not on the map, but right southwest of there is Thessalonica, which is Thessalonians. And we see Ephesus, which is Ephesians. And Corinth, which is First and Second Corinthians. And so we see the gospel continue to go farther and farther. Sneak peek to how this all ends. At the end of the book of Acts, we find out that Paul is arrested back in Jerusalem, but he's a Roman citizen, and so he has a right to go back and be tried in Rome. And so we see even another missionary journey that Paul goes on, at least people call it a missionary journey, even though he's in chains. And that story that we'll get to in a few weeks uh, includes a massive storm and a, a shipwreck and prison and all. And yet God's working in the midst of it all. And Paul can see that God's at work as the movement continues to move forward. They crash in Malta, a small island just south of Sicily and right on the tip of Italy. And you can kind of see that here. Uh, the next slide I think we got. Yep. And they, he finally makes it to Rome, where then in prison, even though he's in prison, he continues his ministry, his teaching, his preaching, his writing. He writes a number of books of the Bible there from jail. And so if you think about it, by the end of Acts, in just less than 25 years, the movement spreads throughout the known world. Now, we don't know a whole lot. We know a little bit, but not a whole lot about how the gospel goes south and how it goes east but what we do know we know in the book of acts how it goes more than 1300 miles northwest all the way to rome and beyond you got to re realize this is a, a time when when there's no internet there's no tvs there's no phones there's no planes trains and automobiles there's just people right walking talking people If we sit back and we think about the book of Acts, what we learn is that even today, even though we're high tech, right, and there's, there's internet and we can reach anything, and uh, you know, the, things go viral really quickly, even though we're high tech and there's planes, trains, and automobiles and all the like, the movement still moves through people. It's God's movement. Spirit is at work in the movement, but God chooses people. In fact, turn with me to Romans 10. We just heard these words not too long ago. Verse 12. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. 
For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So how then can they call on the one who have not believed, they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one that they have not heard? And how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. How can people know that there's a God that loves them, that forgives and frees them from the baggage in their life and the fear that they have? How, how can they know the hope and the purpose that only Jesus can bring in the midst of the chaos in their life if they haven't heard of Jesus? If they haven't heard of the hope that we have to share with them? If they haven't seen and experienced someone who actually knows that grace firsthand? How will they hear and see and experience that message if no one shares? Take a look at this video. I guess it started one morning. I was sitting in church, uh, just a regular Sunday morning, and um, the pastor was talking about missions and long-term and commitment and all of these kinds of things. And I guess normally that would that would impact me a little bit, but this time it was it was different somehow. It was like God was pounding on my chest, and I just got this huge smile on my face, and I was ready. I just started looking at my life and asking myself what would it look like for me to be on mission all the time and devote my life to that and become a missionary, I guess. I remember growing up in church that missionaries would come visit. I was just always captivated by their stories and I knew that there was a, a world that was so much bigger than my backyard and that there were people in that world who needed to hear about Jesus. And I just, I've always wanted to get out there and have the ability to, to tell people about Jesus and see that transform lives. I just kept hearing the same words, planting seeds, nurture, water, tend, person by person, life by life. Don't wait, you're ready, just go. I felt like I was kind of waiting around, like, is this something that God would call me into? And, and when would that happen? Where would I go? What would it look like? And then all of a sudden, it was like this lightning bolt, like, there it is. There it is. It's, I mean, it seemed almost obvious. Some help? Yeah, I just uh, gotta put this in there. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You wanna grab the top? All right. I'll... My name is Bradley Martin, and I am oh, yeah, answering right. God's call to go. And I am a missionary. Hmm. Anybody thought he was gonna like go on a trip or fly away somewhere? Oh, come on, you did. You're like, what? He went to his neighbor? By the way, you do not need to, like, pack five pairs of socks and a whole suitcase to go talk to your neighbor. In fact, it's probably recommended you don't. That would be a little creepy. Anyway, um, the point of this is the mission, the movement is all around us. Do you realize that? The mission, the movement is all around us. It's right outside of your door. The reality is that God's movement is done through us, through you and me. Anybody here ever watch um, infomercials? Anybody? Yeah, have you ever like seen, some people are like, no, no, I would never do that. But, but if you ever watch that, you know, you, you see mo different things from, I don't know, maybe you got curious about Nutri Ninja or P90X, that was a long time ago, but scrub daddy, squatty potty, you know, the snuggy thing and the, the like, and, and, and maybe you got curious about it, but, but it wasn't until you met somebody who actually used the product and said, oh yeah, it's great, I, I love it, you know, you, you, you should buy it. And 
there are people out there, that's why there's infomercials, that, that do the whole impulse buying, but most of us, we're pretty skeptical, aren't we? Come on, 1995, sure. Now, if you think about it, there are a lot of people that are like that about the gospel. Most of our neighbors, they've, they've heard something about Jesus, right? And yet they keep it at an arm's distance away. Because they're skeptical. And I would say it's probably because they haven't met a follower of Jesus. Sure, they've met people who, who say that they're Christians. They, they've met people who, who play the part of, of being a Christian. But they haven't met somebody who allows them in enough to their life to see what it means to be a Christian. They keep people at an arm's distance away because they're not sure if, if it's real. They haven't met somebody to know if, if the promises in here are empty or not. Our staff, we're, we're, uh, we're going to be walking through this book called Joining Jesus. It's, it's by a, a pastor, a Lutheran pastor, Greg Finke. And in there, Finke writes, we are Jesus with skin on. We are tangible a tangible glove for his intangible hand. We are how people experience Jesus. We are the feet that Peter's talking about in Romans. We, you and I. Not just people who have reverend in front of their names. It's us. And we don't have to take a trip to Haiti. We don't have to plan something formal. We don't have to make a speech or something like that. No, what we need to get through our heads is that the mission that God is calling us to is not to the ends of the earth. It's to the nook and crannies of our life. Your life. That's the mission he's called us to be. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't people here in, in, in our midst that are called to go. Go overseas or go outside of our community and to go on a mission trip. In fact, Tim, he, he went on a mission trip earlier this week, a year with some people. He's going this fall. You may want to go to Louisiana and, and partner with him. If you want, talk to me. I'll get you connected with him. We'd love to send a ton of people down there and work with Samaritan's Purse. That is awesome. But here's the problem. Because oftentimes, our definition of missionary is someone who goes somewhere over there, somewhere away from us. And, and so then we think about our own lives and go, ah, you know what? No, I, I don't have a mission. I, I'm not really a part of the movement. No, you know what I'll do? I, I'll donate a little bit of money or I'll donate some supplies for that mission. But guess what? Your neighborhood, your community, your life, is the mission field, and God has called you to go. <laughs> We're how the movement moves. Well, truly, one of the greatest mission fields in the world right now, and people are sending missionaries all over the world to the United States. Do you know that? One of the greatest missionary missions fields is right here. One of the greatest needs is someone to reach the street that you live on, your community. And again, it's not that they haven't heard something about Jesus. They, they're just suspect and skeptical because the Jesus that they've heard about is a distortion of Jesus and his grace. And, and what they need is, is to see our lives and, and, and the grace that we've experienced, the stories of how that grace has impacted our life. What they need to see is a bunch of lives that are not perfect because your life is not perfect. But a life that even though you have issues and and struggles, you have hope. Hope in the midst of chaos. You have peace. You have forgiveness and grace. That's what they need to experience. That's what they need. They need to experience a bunch of people who then will come alongside of them and love them in con unconditionally because Jesus has loved us unconditionally. So I start thinking back in my life, some of those people who did life on mission in my life, and of course, my mom and dad, I, I would say they were those individuals. And, but I also think of Brian Moeller, guy who had a full-time job, a couple kids, very busy. 
but he invested in me and a bunch of other teenagers week after week in our youth ministry during a time when I desperately needed it. I think of Steve Armburst, who kind of took me under his arm during a time in college when I needed it. I think of John, one of my best friends back in high school, and people who invested and shared their faith and their life with me. And then I started thinking about, okay, what about my mission, my, my journey that I'm supposed to be uh, impacting? And obviously I think of my, my kids, right? I, that's, that's the first uh, closest mission field that I have. But then I think of you, you know, I, I'm your pastor and I, I, I pray that God uses me to impact you. But then I, I think of my, my neighbors that I'm working hard to try to meet and, and build relationships. I, I think of that guy two blocks down that I don't know why, but I wave to him every single day because he's always outside. I don't know what he's always doing out there, but he's there. I think of the lady at Kroger who always checks me out. Wait, no, that sounds bad. The lady who checks my groceries out. <laughs> Whoops. I think of those people that are in my path all the time. That's my mission for and the question is, what about you? I mean, are you willing to go on mission? Will you, you be a missionary? Even if that doesn't mean going to, to Haiti or Louisiana or I don't, I don't know, but it means going to your neighborhood and to your work and to, your, to wherever you go shopping, to your everyday life. Because that's what God's called you to. My hope is that you will. You'll look for opportunities to share hope and to be Jesus with skin on it. And, and just maybe you're like, yeah, but I'm not sure what that looks like. I don't know how to start. Well, you know, again, we've been saying over and over again, be the church workshop. That's a great place to start, a place, great place to get the thoughts going. But let me share with you just a couple of stories from just the last couple of months of people, real people right here. You heard... Brandon say just a few moments ago that this past weekend, 20-some-odd uh, youth, they went to a, a family who's fostering. Right there, that family is, is life on mission. They're opening up their family, their home, for kids that are in need. But then those 20-some-odd young adults, they're, they're doing life on mission as they build a, a, a sandbox and do some, some yard work just on a Sunday afternoon and then invest time in those kids. Earlier this week, Sherry came up to me and shared with me, she, she teaches a spin class at, at a gym, and, and, and in the midst of the last few months, God's been working on her, and she goes, man, I wonder if there's a way I can open up a door. And so she, she put out a, a little bowl that said, prayer requests, right in the front when she teaches. And it's not that like every day it's like massively full, but guess what? It has caused some pretty interesting conversations, and there have been prayer requests that have been put in there, and in fact, for her birthday, somebody bought her this beautiful wooden bowl that has engraved on their prayers. Life on mission. Brandon, over the last couple of months, he's had a conversation with this teenager in his neighborhood um, that he, he got talking to, a guy who hasn't been to church or wasn't in a church, and you know, grew up um, not going to church, has never been baptized, and yet um, even though for years he was kind of against going ever to church, now he's asking questions about God. And so he's been coming to the youth ministry, and, and he's been in conversations about God and his grace with some of the other teens and, and asking about this thing called baptism. Bev offered to lead the charge of feeding families for vacation Bible school this past, uh, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, and um, that meant she had to go to Kroger every day and buy massive quantities of stuff. And the clerk that always checks her out, uh, checks her groceries out. Gosh, i got to work on that for the next services. Uh, and she, uh, she kept wondering, what are you buying all this stuff for? And finally, after the second or third day, she asked, uh, so what are you buying this for? And, and so Beth said, well, for vacation Bible school. Oh, really? What, what church do you go to? Well, my... My church is uh, down the road at Holy Cross Lutheran. And, and, and the, the store clerk said, I, I'm Lutheran. I just moved here from Ohio. I, I don't have a church home. And Beth said, well, why don't you come and join us? 
You know, so whether it's inviting someone to church or inviting somebody over, a neighbor over for dinner, or whether it's investing in a relationship at work or, or pausing long enough just to ask somebody how they're doing, or whether it's praying and talking about your faith with a family member. Your life is a mission field. Jesus, as he was sending out the 72, he said this, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out his workers into the harvest field. That's you. You're the workers. It's his movement, yep. But it's carried out through our lives. Our lives that are on mission. 